Thanks for pressing play. This is Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different, where we aspire to have real dialogues that celebrate the people, ideas, and companies that stand out. As usual, we are sponsored by our friends at Oracle NetSuite. Learn to turbocharge the growth of your business today at netsuite.com slash different. On this episode, we go to the future. We hang out with a legit futurist, Mark Pesci. He's the host of a fantastic podcast called The Next Billion Seconds on Podcast One. He's an award-winning columnist for The Register and a host and producer of This Week in Startups. He's also the inventor of VRML, which is the standard on the web for 3D. And Mark tells us why we should not be afraid of the future. He gives us an insight into how the next 10 years will play out. He tells us why he thinks, you ready for this? Glasses are the next killer platform, and I think he might be right, certainly worth paying attention to. We also talk about how technology will transform our health and well-being and a ton more. Go to Lockhead.com for the show notes and learn how to get a hold of Mark and uh, get the key takeaways from this episode. Now, hey-ho, let's go. So, Mark, I'm, I've been dying to ask you, what is it about the future that you want most people to know that you don't think they know? Well, I think most people feel as though they're going to get blindsided by the future, that they don't have agency, that they don't have any control over the future. And I think this is one reason why people get so scared when they think about the future. They get told that a robot is going to come and take their jobs or that a robot's going to rise up and kill them or whatever it is. And they, they tend to think of these things as, oh, my God, this is horrible. There's no way I can prepare. I'm just going to give up. And one of the things I like to do is to show people the path through, to show people that we've always had a path through. And we can take a look at the past for some clues about how we're going to find our way through to the future. And I feel if you do that, then people come out of that with a sense of agency, that there is something that they can do, that there is something that they can be that allows them to really feel like they have not just a stake in the future, but a capacity to keep up with that future. And what do you think it is about human beings, that there's always this Luddite-like, say that three times fast, um, you know, fear that we have of the future and resistance to it. You know, I, a simple example, the first time somebody told me about a DVR, a TiVo, I just thought, oh, that sounds like bullshit. I don't need that. Like I was just the grumpy old man in me comes out and go, ah, fuck that. And and then now, of course, you, there's no way you can watch TV without that capability. Yeah. But But I guess my question is, what do you think it is about us human beings, Mark, where there's always some of that Luddite – uh, blow off or, you know, sometimes we feel threatened, our job might be threatened or those kinds of things where there's, there's, there's often this fear-based uh, concern about big steps forward in technology. And, you know, there's this lovely line and the older I grow, the truer, truer I feel that it is, which is technology is anything that was invented after you turned 20 years old. So for someone who was 15 when TiVo came out, they're just the way that TV works. And for a six-year-old these days, I've been told that if they can't hit the rewind button, they turn to a parent and go, why is this television broken? Yeah. So it's become so much of the, of the inherent experience of the device. So I, I feel like some of it is just simply positional, where we are on the timeline of our lives. Some of it is around how much capacity we can have to absorb novelty. We like to master things and we don't like it when those things change from underneath us because it makes us feel like we're losing our mastery. And that, again, it comes back to this idea that it touches on a fear in us that we're losing our way, that we're losing our grip, that we're going to get swept aside. And and so every time we see that, and of course, the entire world is now becoming all of that, all of the touch points of the world that we're in are all things that are actually moving along. 
And that's a new situation. That's not really something where we have a lot of historical precedent. There was some of it around the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, say 250 years ago, and everything changed in a sort of generational frame very, very suddenly. And there was a lot of the same things we're seeing today. But we don't have a lot of historical precedent for this kind of very rapid change. And so it does tend to make us uneasy because we could tolerate maybe one thing changing or two things changing. But when it's everything changing, it feels almost like we're being persecuted. Why Why is the world changing like this? Why can't we keep up with this? And actually, we need to give ourselves a pass because we're all in this together. It's all changing for all of us together. And we can actually help each other through all of this change because we have the capacity to learn from one another. The most important technology of the last 30 years is Wikipedia. And it's funny because everyone goes, oh yeah, Wikipedia, because everyone kind of uses it, right? But what Wikipedia is, is it's not just this universal encyclopedia. It's this way for one person in one corner of the world to share something they know, and then it is instantaneously available to every other person in every other corner of the world immediately. And if we can keep that in mind, as we get assaulted with all of this new stuff that keeps on popping up in the world, we're going to be able to find our way through it. So it's amazing what you say about this being an unprecedented time. And the way I relate to it is when I started my business career, I started in the technology industry. And the big thing that was going on was the sort of the birth of the personal computer and it becoming a prevalent Mm -hmm. part of uh, business life, uh, business, Mm -hmm. you know, applications. Um, And then that sort of became the canary in the coal mine for this thing that Uh, At the time, we called the move to client server computing. People started coming off of giant mainframes and starting to use these new uh, technologies. And that was the one, you know, or maybe if you want to call them two, the PC and client server. So maybe let's call them two. Two giant fucking technology things going on that had gigantic business opportunity and implications. And, you know, it took several years, you could argue even a decade, for this thing to really play out and ultimately lead to the internet in the, in the nineties. But anyways, mm-hmm. with all that said, the, the aha for me of late Mark is, you know, when I started roughly 30 years ago, that there was this, these two mega things and they were coming together and that was the thing, right? Yeah. And if you go through the list today, the list is mental, right? I mean, there's blockchain and obviously crypto and there's AI and machine learning and obviously the relationship there. And then, of you know, my friend Kevin Maney says that things really changed with the cloud. And so now there's all these self-service cloud applications and yeah. we can, you know, we can have the compute power of Amazon, whatever. And, and you just go on and on IOT and 3D printing. And, you know, uh, I was blown away earlier this or last year when a little girl threw out the first pitch at the San Francisco Giants game with her 3D printed fucking yeah. arm, yeah. right? And on and on and smart everything and sensors everywhere and on. You know, a friend of mine is talking to me about going to this high tech AI sensor enabled agro startup and should he do it or shouldn't he? And like, there's just, and so you go through the, so if there was two mega things on the list 30 years ago, mm-hmm. how many things are on your list right now that you would call major you know, categories of new innovations. So uh, I, I guess one of the, one of the things I get to do as a futurist is to put a frame over everything. And the frame I put over everything that you've just said is that the world is getting smart and the challenge for us. And I think the pressure that we feel is, can we get smart at the same pace the world is getting smart? Now, when when you take a look at technology, and again, I entered the field before the PC. So when there was something called a microcomputer, which was the first version of the Apple, the TRS-80, these are things. And I was a teenager at the time, but these these devices were very important to me because I- The TRS-80 was a very sexy animal there for a while, wasn't it? It was. The first version was not as sexy, but it had an onboard operating system from a tiny little company 
out of New Mexico called Microsoft. Yeah, then when they were in New Mexico. When they were in Mexico. The CRS, they, that, that machine yeah. was made by Radio Shack, wasn't it? Yes. Am I remembering this right? That is, it, it was made by a company that no longer exists because they couldn't keep up with the pace of change in consumer yeah. electronics, right? Yeah, but I, I, I hate to interrupt you, but I, this is a fascinating beginning to this the, the, uh, unveiling of this thought here. So keep going, handsome. Yeah. No, no, no. It's quite all right. So, so if we go all the way back to that, you know, you have this idea that you could have these little pockets of smart. We have these big computers before that. Now we have these little pockets of smart. And over that, and that's a 40-year time span now, right? Because the TRS-80 comes out in 78, 79. So that's literally, that's 40 years ago, quite a bit of time. All we've done in all of that period of time is to learn how to take all of the principles that are embodied in all of this and scatter it throughout the world. And that's really, so what we're doing is we're reaping that harvest of this intelligence of us learning how to master the intelligence that we've been able to place into the world. And so you do have IoT, you do have artificial intelligence, you do have uh, sensors everywhere, which is slightly different from the internet of everything. You now have very high speed mobile broadband networks and more people have access to them than have access to toilets right now. And so you have this incredible sort of connection, wiring, and intelligence of the world. And if you look at it one way, it can seem very threatening because it can seem like the world is going to be so smart that it doesn't need us anymore. And you can take a look at it the other way. Actually, the smarter the world gets, the more it needs human capacity to help direct it and have to help check it. Because a machine can be dumb a million times faster than a human can. And we never should forget that. It's interesting to hear you talk about the fear of it. Um, you know, having having worked in Silicon Valley for so long, while there are people in Silicon Valley who fear things about technology, and there are certain things I fear about technology, so I don't want to uh, be silly about this. But that said, for the most part of my adult life, Mark, I have lived in a world where that's never the, con or that's rarely, maybe I should say it that way, that's rarely the conversation. Yeah. The conversation that I have lived in is first let's understand all the shit. What's all the new hot shit, right? And, and um, you know, I'm hoping we can talk about whatever's on your mind in that regard that you think mm. needs ne needs new light on or a different light on. Um, and then, of course, the next thing is, well, so if we were smart and we were us, what would we do given what we now understand about all the new shit? How would we create new categories of innovation and businesses and create new value and, yeah. and, and take companies, companies public and, you know, do, you know, do all this stuff. What would we invest in and what type of entrepreneurs and on and on and on. This is the world that I've lived in. So it's, it's just an interesting thing to hear you sort of go on about sort of trying to get people comfortable. And I would imagine some huge percentage of the world needs to hear that. Um, and yet where I live, that's generally not what we talk about. <laughs> What's interesting, it really started at CES 2017, so just a little over two years ago. I heard a change in the conversation because I, I'm completely with you. I think all of the years that conversation was very much almost a single track about all the amazing things and how we build businesses and products and services and help people and all of this. But around the beginning of 2017, the conversation started to take a different turn because there was a real sense, and this is from people who have been working in technology as long as I have, that perhaps some of the things we were doing and some of the directions we were going were not as helpful as we had originally thought they would be. And it's really interesting because I think that without sort of pillaring them, what's happened to Facebook over the last two years has been the defining example of how that's worked, right? That we, we've seen how they can use artificial intelligence at scale to profile their users and then to basically manipulate the news feeds and then manipulate the emotions of those users. And we know this, this is all now out in the public. Well, and then and, not trusted yeah. anymore. Uh, no. Do you remember recently there was this, this uh, viral thing that people were, uh, Facebook was encouraging people to do where I, show a picture of myself from 10 years ago and I show a picture of myself today. It's sort of the then and now, right? And it's like, how did this become a thing? And I, I don't know about you, but whenever these sort of mass viral things start happening, I, you know, the conspiracy, conspiracy theorist in me starts going, did this really just happen organically or is fucking something going on here? And of course the theory is who knows if it's true. Maybe, you know, um, that 
Facebook encouraged it because um, it's teaching their their um, their facial recognition algorithm things, right? And the thing is with Facebook, because there's both a lack of transparency and a bit of uh, history here that people are now starting to err on the side of caution and perhaps a degree of paranoia with respect to their intentions. Do you and think that seems really people are really changing now. Well, people seem to be caught in a bit of a bind, and this is actually very much the front line of my own work right now, not just as a futurist, but as someone who's helping to sort of find ways for culture to be able to grapple with all of this technology, which is we're in this interesting place where social media has definitely connected us in a way that we find very rewarding, but there's a price associated with that. And that bill did not get presented for a while, right? You know, back in the 2000s when Facebook and Twitter and all this stuff was taking off, it just all seemed completely great and nothing bad happened. And now we're seeing how, in fact, there's a whole set of consequences, both positive and negative, that are associated with them. And there are a lot of people who have a wish, and I, the wish is, is, is infantile, not because it's a baby wish, but because it's kind of not fully immature, that we want to have all the good stuff with none of the bad stuff. And it doesn't work that way. And part of yeah. what we need to do is so just sort of. The question is, what do we do yeah. about the bad stuff, right? So, yeah. w when recently we had this, um, I thought it was highly ironic that fa that Apple was making fun of Google for being mm -hmm. um, having Android be secure, less secure than than Apple. They had they ran an ad that said, "What happens on your iPhone stays on your iPhone." Remember this? And then yeah. just a few weeks. Oh, later, it was. It it right. was 10 stories tall outside the Las Vegas Convention Center at CES this year. So, yes, I, I right. remember it. It was, it was very subtle. <laughs> and then a yeah. few weeks later, remember this, Mark? We find out because that kid, I want to say he was in New Hampshire, but wherever the fuck he was, some kid figured out there was an open hole with FaceTime that made it super easy for people to take over your fucking camera on FaceTime. And, and, and so here's my point. That happens to Apple. And there's no ramification. Mm -hmm. Maybe their stock price went down a little bit. It probably didn't get hurt over any meaningful period of time. Um, maybe their sales got hurt a little bit. It's not going to impact their sales in any meaningful way over time. And so they make this giant security gaffe that could impact mm -hmm. all of our lives mm -hmm. and really suffer nothing from it. And so, you know, you, with Facebook, What's going to make Facebook, you know, when we found out Facebook was giving our messages to uh, Netflix, by way of example, that was, right. to me, that was an outrageous thing, right? Yeah. But again, nothing fucking happens to Facebook. And so if, if, if either bad behavior or, or sloppy security hurts you and I, but there's no impact to these companies, what, why would they change their behavior, I guess is my question. So the impacts actually look different than perhaps we're expecting. And, and I think what we can see is the impacts are generational. So there's a generational difference in how people are using Facebook. The seniors, so the grandparents, and even the parents use Facebook normally, as we would think of it. Their kids are not. And their kids are either using private networks, they're using Telegram, they're using Signal, they might be using WhatsApp, which is one reason why Facebook bought WhatsApp. But they're using private groups. Networks. They're also using Instagram, which is seen as being friendlier and happier and freer and just sort of less involving. And they're also using Snap because they see these as being more private ways where they're not under the continuous surveillance of something like Facebook. And so what we're seeing is rather than people quitting Facebook in droves, is we're seeing there's going to be a generational migration to platforms that to feel other platforms better. that Facebook owns. <laughs> Yeah. Well, in the case of Instagram and, and WhatsApp, absolutely the case. In the case of Snap or some of the others, Telegram yeah. or some of the others, they're, they're, they're different private platforms. And I think that, that this is the thing. A, a bunch of work came out in uh, uh, Blake Harrison's new book, uh, History of the Future, about how Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg need to be in front of the revolution in augmented and virtual reality, that they need to get to augmented reality spectacles, which are one of the things that are coming down the pike over the next couple of years, because 
they don't own a smartphone platform and they know that they can be shut out of a smartphone platform. And if users migrate away to a different app on a smartphone platform, then that's Facebook done for. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, that's very interesting. I, I'm curious to ask you, okay, so it's 10 years from now. What are a few yeah. things that have happened that uh, I might find surprising or counterintuitive? People will be using their smartphones less because, or at least a certain number of people are. And, and there's going to be two reasons for that. One is that we're going to be much more intensely aware of how they're designed to lure us in and to addict us. And so we're probably going to have more structure built around that to help prevent that or to at least help make us aware of it. Okay. So I feel like that that's, we're going to have a different kind of relationship to that device in our hand. But the other side of that coin is we're also going to be wearing devices that will look like sunglasses. They're going to be these augmented reality spectacles, which will effectively be like having a smartphone display laid out over the world around as we walk around. And the funny thing about that is that people are really going to clamor for this because it's going to add a texture and depth to the world in data that it doesn't have today. And so there's going to be these two directions, one of which is going to sort of try to give us more space and another one of which is going to really try to jam it right over all our eyes. And for most people, these will be true part of the time. And for some people, they're going to be true in each case almost all of the time. And we're going to see different kinds of cultures really emerge out of the different relationships that we have to connection and to data. Yeah, and I think... So I, I want to talk to you about the time frame because I find that curious. But in terms of what I understand around um, the glasses comment, mm. um, I'm not even sure it'll still be called augmented reality. It'll be a new layer of a digital experience, right? So we'll look at a building and we'll see data about that building, right? And Or maybe we'll see, yeah. to your point on Wikipedia, we may see the Wikipedia entry that'll tell us what year it was built and who the architect was and how many floors it's got, or or maybe- And the building directory and who's in the offices in the building and all of that. And how do I check in digitally? Because I'm yeah. going to the sixth floor to see Mark and all yeah. you can imagine these things. So um, there's this sort of, I don't know if it'll still, maybe it still will be, but in my mind, the way I think of it is a digitally enhanced reality uh, uh, that there's a digital overlay on our life now um, that's always there. Yeah, it's what's interesting is let's even turn that around because in fact, that digital overlay is already there and neither of us can see it. And that's the interesting thing is it's the reveal because that data is already there. We've spent the last 30 years building that data into the world and putting that data into all of these systems. You talked about all these different touch points with IoT and AI and all. Those are all these data systems and they're all invisible to us. And that's another reason why we feel a little bit at sea in this world. It's because we know these systems are all around us and we can't see any of them. They're not transparent to us. They're not visible. And so part of what's going to happen is not just that we'll see that later, but that a lot of these systems will be revealed to us. And I think in some ways that's going to be exciting and exhilarating. And in other ways, it's probably going to be a bit confronting. Hmm. Now, I'm, I'm curious about the timing. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not in any way, shape or form disagreeing with you. I'm just sort of curious. You think within 10 years... Um, this, this, what I'm describing as digital overlay, this augmented reality glasses, where essentially we now look at, um, life through a smartphone, if you want to put it that way, yeah. um, that that is a reality that there's some meaningful percentage of us walking around, uh, you know, we used to call them in Silicon Valley as glass holes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or gargoyles. Uh, we are already seeing both Magic Leap and Microsoft, right, working and having realistic versions of this. The first sort of first generation of Magic Leap, Microsoft just released their second generation on Sunday. So we can see what the, what's happening. Everyone knows that Apple is working very, very, very hard on this, as is Facebook. And so when you have that much capital, so it's several trillion dollars in capital just being focused on what the next platform is going to be and there's broad consensus. You say this billion or trillion? Trillion, because these are trillion dollar companies. Okay, it's not like they're putting trillions of R&D on this, but they are, tri yes, we have trillion well, no, 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 dollar they're, companies. They're not, but when a trillion dollar company gets focused on something, it tends to happen. Yeah, they take up a lot of space. 
Yeah. And and so, so there's this this broad sense that this is the next platform. There's a lot of detail work between now and then. We will see certainly within the next decade something from Apple that will be the beginning of something that's good enough. Apple, interestingly, with the exception of the iPhone, tends to be a category follower rather than a category leader, but they also tend to be a category definer. This is one of their very interesting rules in the world because they don't release something until it meets their incredibly specific demands. The exception, the modern exception to that, interestingly, is the Apple Watch. The Apple Watch was released before anyone really knew what it was good for. And now, and I actually do want to talk about this at some point, they've become instrumental in, in understanding ourselves in our health. You know, they've become the necessary sampling tool for our health. Where we're going with this, this is where a lot of people get spooked. I mean, I'm candidly, first of all, I'm a watch guy, so I don't yeah. I like what wearing like a, a you know, a man watch with all due respect to the Apple Watch or with no due respect to the Apple Watch. But that said, you know, I don't have an Alexa. Yeah. I don't have an Apple Watch. Yeah. And I just don't want these companies that much further up my ass. Yeah. Right? Like, and, you know, with Alexa, it listens to everything in your house. Yeah. Now, my friend Jason DeFilippo, who, by the way, if you don't know his podcast, Grumpy Old Geeks, it's, it's all time. Uh, him and his partner, just uh, very smart guys and very grumpy and it's hysterical. Anyways. <laughs> Good. He tells me that he did packet analysis and that the Alexa device does not do anything until you say her name. But And so I believe him because I'm not a technical guy, but it still creeps me out. And now we wear these devices that tell Apple, you know, everything about what's up with our body, how much we're sleeping and all that stuff. And I read recently, Mark, that, and I might get the date wrong, but it seemed to be, my memory is, by 2020, the relative near term that um, even if you haven't given your DNA to 23andMe or um, uh, Ancestry.com, they were for, for all practical purposes have it anyway. And, you know, we're starting to see this. Just by a process of understanding all of your ancestors. Yeah, they, they, if, they, if they have a quarter of your family, or I don't, I don't know what yeah. the number is, but if they have yeah. some, some number of your family, they sort of plus or minus have you. Uh, you may have seen there was this this longtime uh, uh, killer on the loose in California um, that they caught. Uh, because his nephew or something like that, and you know, away you go, right? So, all this stuff's going on, and so we have all this technology that's like on us and in us and uh, mm. tracking us, and it's just, you know, it's a little too um, 1984 for me <laughs> sometimes. So, yeah. so you really believe ten years from now, no bullshit, we are gonna we are gonna experience the world through these digital glasses. I think that there will certainly be a percentage of the population. And again, like the smartphone, right? The smartphone sort of was a was a slow burn at the start. And then sort of within three years, it reached this tipping point to where we're now got 4.5 billion adults using smartphones, which is just an incredible acceleration. So I would say that in a decade's time, we'll probably see a, an adoption that might look at somewhere between one and 5%, but that one and 5% will be concentrated in the richest countries. And so it will be much more visible to us in America and in yeah. Australia and in Europe and in Japan than it would be if you were in India or Africa, where they will still probably be using the smartphone and finding amazing unexpected ways to use smartphones. And that will continue. I mean, we really have only scratched the surface of what we can do with smartphones. It's not so much what the smartphone is as a platform with chips go in it and how fast it runs. It's like, yeah, okay, that's great. What's more, how do people use the smartphone to organize themselves, to organize their lives, to organize their health? It's all of that. That's the stuff that is just barely getting started. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I mean, I'll give you you want you want an example. You may know this, but it was a, a fun experience in my life recently. Mm. I have a dear friend who is a retired fire chief, mm. and in his years of service, he was subject to this is before they really wore much hearing protection, and uh, he was the uh, you know subject to several massive explosions, and he's got very limited hearing today. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is um, 
he sort of has to see you to be able to talk to you and he wears hearing aids and you know all that it's a challenge and and as a group of friends when we get together if we want to go out to dinner it's tough because the way i guess i don't know shit about hearing aids but the way the technology works it's very hard with lots of noise around to yes. distract the conversation yeah so uh about two weeks ago mark um he shows up at this lunch with a group of us and he takes out his hearing aids and he puts in his wireless apple earbuds whatever those mm -hmm. are, ear pods whatever they're called mm -hmm. and he puts his smartphone his iphone down in the middle of the uh, table that we're all seated at for lunch and he listens to the conversation completely through his uh, smartphone. Yeah. 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 And, and the, the smartphone, smartphone has the sensors and the software. That's right. And it's able to edit down some of the background noise and yeah. figure out that the people talking closer to the phone are the people that he wants to track with. And so he can look the other way and yeah. you can say his name and he turns around and looks at you. And that's just not an experience I've had in the entire time I've known him. And so to your point, you know, this is at least in my world, maybe it's been out for a while, but I think this is fairly new shit here. And that is transformative in that in that use case. I mean, it's extraordinary. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, one of my friends has a cochlear implant because he has uh, nerve deafness and he was just up visiting on the weekend and he just gotten a new upgrade. He got his new upgrades and he can now Bluetooth connect to his cochlear implant. So he can yeah. listen to streaming music, but he can also take his phone in a noisy environment, put it down somewhere and then have it stream the conversation directly to him. Into his in head. His <laughs> into his head by his cover and he jokes about being a cyborg he's actually quite proud of it because he's a bit geeky and so he really enjoys the fact when he gets a software upgrade or gets a hardware upgrade but again it's around how these devices are being used together and your friend is able to do something with airports my friend needs to have a cochlear implant we have a range of different uh, i guess uh, devices and affordances there we're going to need even more of them and i know voice interfaces are disturbing at one level, but they're also enormously liberating. So if we take the case of India, and there was this lovely report that came out, I think, in December, where it basically talked about YouTube being the Google of India, because in a population where you don't have the same literacy skills, broadly, same literacy skills as you might in America or in Australia, people want something that's going to talk to them. And they're going to want a search that can talk to them. So we now have voice search and then going to YouTube. Yes. And you really have this interesting channel that's more human because it's not just around text and all the stuff that you need to do to be able to absorb text, but more conversational. And so you have something that's good for a billion or two billion people who own smartphones that don't have strong literacy skills. And it's the same thing as having that microphone on your smartphone helping you to understand. Yeah. No, listen, I love that shit. I'm somebody who learns more from listening. Um, and so, you know, thus podcasting. Um, and and if you have uh, visual and audio at the same time, you know, the, the, YouTube is the first place you go when you want to learn to do anything, right? If you want to learn how to fix this new thing you got, then, you know, you know, there's no manual anymore. We go to YouTube, you want to learn how to clean your stove or whatever the fuck it is. You, the, you go to YouTube and there's some video of, with some person who's going to just nicely done for God knows what fucking reason, probably you know, sometimes economic, but many times not, who has a 20 minute video on how to clean the shit in your fucking stove, your exact model, right? It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, and that comes back to it's kind of that's kind of the other Wikipedia, right? It's the Wikipedia, not of facts, but the Wikipedia of experience yeah. of, of all of these skills. Cool. And all of that is building. And we we're really not good at indexing it. You know, that's the thing is a search box is in some ways it's it's good. But we've lost this idea of taxonomy, which is what Wikipedia has, which is this idea that there is, in fact, an architecture to knowledge and that it's possible to get into some place in that architecture and then to follow it out. And it's, you can't really do that with Wikipedia. You can't really do that. With, uh, pardon, you can't do that with YouTube or with Google as easily. And so some of this knowledge feels a lot more fragmented. And I think, again, this is going to be one of the interesting shifts over the next 10 years. And the thing is, I don't think it's going to be humans, weirdly, that's going to be that are going to be creating these uh, taxonomies. I think it's probably going to be AIs. 
They're just going to do it themselves. Are we going to have, I remember I saw this recently of a AI generated newscaster in, yeah. I want to say it was Japan. I could be wrong. China. It was China. It was, it was China? CCTV. Yep. Thank you. I know it was Asian. Excuse me. But, um, uh, and, and you, and you watch the fucking thing and you think, is anybody going to want to watch this? And then I thought to myself, Hey self, Max Headroom was a giant success. Exactly. So like, exactly. what are you talking about? We already have proof that people will absolutely do this. Who yeah. knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe half the newscast, half the human newscasters are going to get shot because everybody's <laughs> going to be watching Max Headroom again. I, I don't know what's going on here, Mark. Yeah, I, I think it's always it's going to be an interesting play. I think there's going to be a real mix between the synthetic and the human because each of them have very unique qualities that they will bring to their performances and that people will enjoy the difference in the performances rather than the sameness of all one or the other. It's like, you know, we've only had vanilla and we're about to get chocolate. Well, that doesn't mean you stop liking vanilla. It means that you actually start to find ways to use vanilla and chocolate. I know, but now we have new flavors that freak me out a little. The other one that freaks me out in this regard is... Is, and I don't think they're legally binding marriages, but that these these dudes in Japan who marry, you know, digital women. Oh. It, it, it's, it's very weird. Anyway, but I digress. Um, here's the other question I sort of have for you. What what of the huge list of things that we are sort of uh, thinking about today? Mm. Do you think 10 years from now maybe won't have been as important or will disappoint in some way, or maybe won't catch the way we uh, think it might. Is there anything sort of going on right now that you don't see playing out? So, you know, and one of my big focuses right now is I'm doing a series called The Next Billion Cars, which is really about the transformations that are taking place in transportation right now. And part of what we're covering on this show is autonomous vehicles. And autonomous vehicles have very much been pushed at us as, oh my God, these are the next big thing. And I'm not arguing that it is. What I am saying is it's harder than it looks. And let me put it real simple. We're basically asking all of the car companies who are really good at making lots of models of a car to become the most sophisticated artificial intelligence companies in the world. Because that's what it takes to make a self-driving car. They have to basically be the most sophisticated robot, the smartest, most intelligent, most adaptable, most flexible robot that you've ever seen. We're asking them all to do this from a standing start. And they've all said, oh, yeah, that's fine. We're going to do this within three years. And they're all walking that back now because the further they got into the problem, the harder they saw the problem was. And they also saw they had to turn themselves into AI companies, which they're not. So everyone is kind of walking around asking themselves, will my children need driver's licenses? Will we design our cities? This, that, and the other thing. We will still need to answer all of those questions, but it looks like we're actually going to have a little time to have a think about answering those questions. Like It's not going to happen tomorrow. Even Google, which may be in the lead with Waymo, their self-driving car division, they still have human beings in the driver's seat in all of these cars because no one really trusts the software or yeah. learning enough to let I mean, when we had the around. Tesla kill that gal, um, yeah. it sort of, yeah. everybody went, holy cow, you know, the, yeah. the, car, the cars are weapons. We always knew cars were weapons, right? But now when you give a car a mind of its own, you start to, you know, you're not going to ask, okay, how sure are we that the designer of these things did their job? And one of the best ideas I've heard about making these things safe is that Toyota and a bunch of other companies are building systems. The Toyota system is called Guardian. It's essentially a backseat driver for your self-driving car. So it just sort of gives it advice on things that might be ignoring. But the thing about Guardian that's really great is Toyota is going to introduce it for normal cars first. So it's going to be a backseat driver for you. It's going to help humans be better drivers. See, and that's, I don't know about this, Mark. So can I, can I tell you a quick story about this? Sure. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I are driving and we're probably going uh, roughly 40 miles an hour and we get smashed from behind um, from a woman who turns out was on her phone in her seventies, yeah. smashes yeah. into us. Anyway, cars totaled. Mm. So we're car shopping. So we have a rental and it was an SUV. So they got to put you in a new SUV. So the, the rental we have, is a uh, Chevy Tahoe. 
you know, right. big SUV. Yeah. Anyway, I had never experienced this. You probably know this because you've been living in the future longer than I have. But this car, as part of its sensory system, doesn't just sort of beep when it hears something near you. It, it sends a vibration through the chair. So we have a narrow driveway and I back down the driveway and some of the tree limbs hang into the drive. So anyway, you're driving backwards and this thing is like giving you a slight taser shot every time mm. you go by a tree. You follow me? Yeah. And it's like, no. um, hey, assholes, like I, I, I get this alerting me, but this is not the way to do this. Like I, my punishment for you guys inventing this thing is I'm going to lock you in it and make you drive it exactly. nonstop for a month and see how you feel. You know, and this is one of the most amazing things is that car designers, even the people who design the interior experience of the cars, they have a lot of options now on how to notify you. And if you think about the notification hell that we went through with smartphones a couple of years ago, and suddenly everyone just sort of yes. started to turn off their notifications, we're kind of getting to that point with cars. I saw the launch of a car called the M Byte from a new Chinese car maker called Byton. And the, the, the dashboard is a 48 inch wide touch sensitive and gesture sensitive display. And you could tell that when it was turned up to bright white, you wouldn't be able to see the road. It would just outshine the road. And we actually sat down with the designer and went, have you thought through all of the design on this? And they made it clear that they were still working it through. But it is possible and easy these days for car designers to do things that seem to make sense on paper. But when you actually get someone on the road, Not they turn out to be horrible experiences. Yeah, I don't want and, you tasing my ass when I drive yeah. by a tree. I really don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, so there's a whole set of design options that are open to car designers now and to car drivers because there's probably a switch somewhere buried deep in the car software that lets you turn that off. But how would you even know? Exactly. Exactly. Now, I know I don't have you for a ton longer. I'm curious, um, you know, are there a couple of things you wanted to touch on before we wrap some some other uh, futuristic mind bending things for me? <laughs> So one of the things that I'm seeing is going to be the most interesting thing. And again, it ties into the whole smartwatch thing. The smartwatches are now becoming the personal data center for your health, right? They're attached to your skin. They can read your pulse rate. They can read your activity level. Apparently, the new Samsung watch can also read your blood pressure. The people aren't clear on exactly how accurate that is. But you're starting to get this, this wealth of biometric data from yourself, and that data can, could be fed into an artificial intelligence model, both the broad one so you can understand populations as a whole, but also an individual one for you and integrate with everything you eat and everything else that you do. And I can see that going very naturally into a service that you would subscribe to that wouldn't be Alexa, that wouldn't be Google, but would be this other thing and would presumably be presented as a wellness thing but would have a medical aspect to it as well. And that the job of that system, that app, that subscription is to keep you as well as it possibly can by nudging you all of the time, right? And again, is this, this going to tase me when I have the third yeah. year? Is that what it's going to do? <laughs> no, it, but it, it, it may go... No, I, I think I don't not. Want it to I think, nag me. I know exactly. in my life nags me. My wife doesn't nag me. I don't have that kind of a relationship. And listen, I'm a grown man here, Mark. If I want to have a third yeah. beer, can I have one? Or is the you wife going to nag me? <laughs> you absolutely can. I don't think it's going to nag you. And I think that's part of what we're going to negotiate around these systems now. It's like, how can these things have intimate knowledge of us without feeling like they're being invasive? Like, that was not a question we were asking a decade ago. It wasn't a question we had language for a decade ago. And now every time you open Facebook, you're like, oh, my God, because it's, it's that moment. But the benefit here is that if they can be, we can enter a new kind of wellness, which is a kind of sustained wellness into our 60s, 70s, 80s. And, I, you know, I'm 56 years old. This is very much front and center in my thinking is how do I actually use the enormous wealth of tools in the world, some of which I've helped to create, some of which I'm helping to promote, some of which I'm making use of. How do I actually use this world that we've created to help me be as well as I can for as long as I can. It feels like that's a good thing to be doing with all of this rather than just sort of sitting around and messaging one another. 
Not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. So it's interesting, isn't it? It, it, it if you sort of play this thing out and it, it it tracks to what I know and you know more than I do for sure, but that the smartphone, the killer app for it, and there may be others, but mm-hmm. maybe the killer app is going to be wellness and health related. Yeah, I think for the smartwatch, absolutely. For the smartphone and whatever it connects into, it's going to be all of that. There is a Google-sized company, actually probably larger than a Google-sized company, probably a Google times 10-sized company because it ends up being a biomedical company, right, that emerges in the next billion seconds, so over the next 30 years, that is doing this, that is focused on this. And whether there's just one of them or there's a Chinese one and a Russian one and an American one and an EU one, which is probably more likely the model, yeah. um, then there's several of these companies that are sitting on an enormous amount of wellness data. It's tied into insurance and all of these other things. And this is, of course, where it gets creepy because do I raise your insurance rate over the next 48 hours because you had that third beer? Well, Anne, what if I have your 23andMe data and mm-hmm. I know that your genome is telling me that your family is more prone to alcoholism and then, yeah. and then now I pay more insurance and, you know, like, <clears throat> shit gets weird fast, right? It's already weird. And again, I think it's just not transparent to us how weird it has become. And it's over that next period of time that it gets very clear that it's gotten very weird, particularly around our health. You're absolutely right. So, so let me make a statement and sort of gauge your reaction. I have a belief that at some point, I'm not sure when, but probably in the next decade-ish, mm-hmm. um, and look, I'm not a big government guy, far from it, but that the government, you know, if you sort of think about GDPR, I think we're going to have to get to a place that says we as individuals own our data. It becomes it becomes a right that our data is ours and that if some company is going to do something with our data, they need our permission. They need to pay us. They need to inform us. They, it needs to be highly transparent that you can. And, and even if you agree to something, you know, we all click. I agree. Well, nobody's read any of the fucking yeah. things we all I agree to. Right. We have no clue yeah. what's going on. Right. Yeah. So that's not going to be it. It's going to be laws that say Mark owns Mark's data. And if digital company X wants to do anything with his data, they need to ask him, they need his permission because it's, it's his data and that's his right. What do you think of uh, my belief that that, that needs to happen? So we're already seeing this happen at the national level, data sovereignty, right? The Indians are basically requiring that all of the data gets stored locally, certainly in Australia and most of the regulatory domains, if it's government data or touches government data, it has to be stored inside the regulatory domain. And this is one reason why Amazon has data centers inside of so many regulatory domains, because they basically want to be able to tick that box for a client. So we're seeing that again at the national level, and we already know that the Chinese basically keep all of their own data. They always have. They never really wanted to put their data anywhere else. So that's part of it. The other side of it is then personal data sovereignty, which is what you're touching on. And I'm very much guided by the thinking of Tim Berners-Lee, the man who invented the web, and someone that I worked with 25 years ago when I was doing my original work to bring 3D to the web. And he decided he was going to tackle this problem, which you've identified very clearly head on. And so he's created a new system for storing your data, which he calls solid. And for solid, when you go and use a website, all of the data that you're generating around that website is stored locally. And that website has to ask for permission to use the data that you've generated to use that website. So it's never your data is being stored on the cloud and you have to beg for it back and you won't get it because they won't want to share it. It's always you're being stored. So it reverses the model and he sees that as his original mistake. And it wasn't even his original mistake because I was around in those days. We just didn't kind of envisage that the web would be used in this way. That developed organically in the late 1990s. Um, from the beginning with cookies, but actually moving on from there. And so part of what we need to do is rethink the way that we're designing these systems. It may take regulation to force those redesigns, to force um, the commercial organizations to make the changes they need so that you actually do maintain control of your data. Yeah. 
Although, interestingly enough, if a guy like that were to be able to unleash something that took the took the data back, it, it could happen organically, possibly. Uh, he certainly – look, at, he set up everything. This, the, all the code is out there. He's got a company called Interrupt. He's doing all of the right things, but now he has to get the companies themselves to take it up. And so part of what we need to do as consumers is to demand that as an option when we're using one of these services. You know, it doesn't have to be the only way, but it has to be an option that we can then take for ourselves. Yep. Fascinating. Mark, anything else before we kick out of this one? So we worry a lot about AI in the future. And one of the stories I always like to tell about this, about whether AI is going to simply run over us, is the story that happened two years ago. And back two years ago, a human named KG was the best human Go player in the world. So this Go is that Chinese game with the white and black discs. It was beaten five games out of five by a computer called AlphaGo that was created by Google. And everyone thought that was probably going to be 20 years away. And suddenly it had already happened. And you're KG, what do you do? Do you hang up your Go board? You're like, okay, I've been beaten by a computer. Or do you realize that all of a sudden you're the best human Go player in the world and you've been handed a compo- uh, an opponent who is completely implacable? And KG started playing AlphaGo regularly and suddenly became not just the best human Go player, but maybe, they can't really tell, the best human Go player there's ever been because he's playing a foe that's that much better. And that's kind of the first half of the it's story. The, the computer is the greatest coach of all time, not the worst opponent of all time. Right, exactly. And, and grasping the future like that. But then there was the second aspect of it, which is that if you, if KG plays the computer, the computer is going to beat him. If KG, if the computer plays the computer, it's going to be sort of 50 50, right? If KG and the computer play the computer, well, you think it's just still going to be 50 50 and you'd be wrong. It turns out that a human and a computer play Go in complementary ways and they will always wipe the deck with just the computer. And so this has now led to what they're calling pair play. So you have world class Go players working with AlphaGo, playing against world class Go players playing with AlphaGo, and these Go games, unlike any Go games that have ever been played before, because each side is using the best capacities of both. So it's not about us versus the computer. It's about us pairing with the computer, creating what I'm calling a super tool, which is us in partnership that that's the future. And all of us, whatever we're doing, we need to find those super tools and put them to work for us. Fascinating. That's fucking fascinating, Mark. The other thing my my, play, my head goes to is, uh, as I know you know, there's been this massive explosion of esports. Yes. And I found out, I don't know, in the last nine months or so, I didn't know this, that there are real, you know, in the parlance of our times, legit universities in the United States giving full ride economic scholarships to esports athletes, yeah. which... This is the greatest category redesign in history because they used to be called, you know, I- 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 idiots who can't get a date who play video games. And now they're couch potatoes. Exactly. It's, it's, it's unbelievably great. But, you know, so with all that said, my mind goes to, wow. So are we going to be watching, you know, esports athletes of, you know, whatever the game is uh, in this paired up scenario? Um, you can imagine you're going to see a lot of that, right? Yes, you'll absolutely see a lot of that. And we haven't seen a lot of AI. We see AI sort of in the non-playing characters in games, but we haven't seen them become partners in the play of the game. And I think that's because we're still seeing that as a very human thing rather than this next level partnership. But we've now seen StarCraft being played by Alpha. I think Alpha StarCraft, whatever it was, a couple of weeks ago that they showed that all. So we're now starting to see how this tool can be used in video gaming. So I can't imagine it's going to be very long before we see that happen. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Well, Mark, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time. I have immensely enjoyed this conversation. You're a fantastic, uh, fantastically insightful guy and a a hell of a dance partner. And you've given me a lot of cool things to think about. So, oh, and I love your podcast. Um, uh, You know, thank you for doing what you do. I think it's uh, um, a very, very fresh take. So uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Mark Pesci, my friends. Now, 
If it's grow time, it's no time. <laughs> We're going to figure out all the Dr. Susie rhymes we can come up with uh, for knowing and growing. Uh, because that's what our friends at NetSuite help you do. Know your numbers and grow your business. And as a listener to this podcast, uh, NetSuite is offering you a free one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry. So why not check out netsuite.com slash different. And um, now, interestingly enough, you know, if you go back, NetSuite has been a pioneer in um, the cloud, in ERP, and in digital commerce since 1998. This is an entrepreneurial business started and run uh, for entrepreneurial businesses. And NetSuite provides an e-commerce solution um, that unifies your front end and your back end. And as we all know, you want to have your front and your back deeply coupled <laughs> today. Uh, NetSuite powers thousands of online businesses and helps them grow. And with NetSuite, you can design the exact experience you want for your brand. You can, if you will, transform your digital store to deliver a continuous shopping experience by unifying uh, everything online. And if you have in-store, uh, that is to say you have physical stores, you can connect the two to have a seamless experience so that customers who deal with you in person or on the web, or mobile, or on any device, can have an awesome experience. Their res responsive design capability allows you to uh, uh, deliver device-optimized online shopping experiences that display elegantly across smartphones, tablets, laptops, desktops, and whatever else you consume technology on. With NetSuite, you'll have one platform instead of maintaining multiple fragmented systems to try to get tie together your website, your order management, your inventory, etc. And with amazing dashboards and reports, with NetSuite, you'll always know what you need to know to grow. So visit netsuite.com slash different today. And uh, if you want to get a hold of us, you can always send an email to blackhole at lockhead.com, on Twitter or uh, Instagram at lockhead. And uh, why don't you check out our beautiful website and, uh, and subscribe. All right. We would like to thank the awesome podcast, The Next Billion Seconds on Podcast One with our friend and guest today, Mark Pesci, the number one bestseller, Niche Down, How to Become Legendary by Being Different. Check it out on Amazon.com. Uh, a, a nonprofit that I love, the good folks at OneLifeFullyLive.org, where we help you dream, plan, and live your best life. And the amazing people at Atranet, if you are in the B2B business, if you're in the Silicon Valley area and you want your website to represent your company like your best spokesperson, check out atre.net today. And the incredible folks at the Front Row Foundation, giving people with life-threatening conditions an experience that they will always remember. Check out the frontrowfoundation.org. All right, I need to remind you that this podcast is the sole property of the Lockhead Oddcast Network, and all rights do remain perturbed. We must warn you that clearly this podcast is produced in a studio that does contain nuts. Uh, don't forget to teach kids the future. Tell two people you love about two podcasts you love. And remember, if you're an iPhone user and you have Siri enabled, you can just, uh, at a cocktail party or something like that, grab your friend's iPhone and say, Hey, Siri, subscribe to Christopher Lockhead. Follow your different. And she'll do it. It's awesome. Uh, listen to the Ramones. Thank you, Candy Dandy. Love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go to Dennis Mullenberg, CEO of Boeing. Sorry, Dennis, we just ran out of time for you. That's it. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with me. It, um, you know, it warms the cockles of my heart. <laughs> this is a passion project, and uh, we do this for fun and hopefully to make a difference. Stay legendary, and until we're together again, follow your different.